In fact, it's a teaching sermon I'm a little bit afraid of because I got to this point where I realized I cannot possibly know everything I need to know to do justice to what it is I want to preach. And that's a scary thing for a preacher, right? Especially about 8.30 when it's really kicking in that I don't know everything I need to know to preach what I need to preach. And the reason for that is because we're going to hit a subject that I, it's one of those subjects I say it's like the, it's like the fudge royal ice cream, right? Anybody got the fudge royal ice cream when you were a kid? And it was like all vanilla with the fudge in the middle. And once you hit that vein of fudge, right, you saw where the fudge was going, you kept digging that out. You're like, I can't eat this much ice cream, but there's that fudge still, and I have to keep going. And basically, you have the whole carton in the bowl by the end of the thing, except for the little vanilla on the side. Um, I was married to a woman that if we got Neapolitan ice cream, there would just be one straight chocolate missing and still strawberry and vanilla, right? So there's a lot to go over in this. Um, eventually we'll end up in 2 Corinthians 3, but that's not going to be for a while. In fact, we'll start back at Romans 8, where we were at last week, to kind of pick up there. I don't know if you knew this or not, but nobody in the Middle Ages thought the earth was flat. How many of you learned in school that in the Middle Ages they thought the earth was flat and that Columbus was going to sail off the edge of it? Did you know they did not think that? That when you look at medieval manuscripts and things like that, they actually knew because ships would disappear over the horizon that the earth was a curve. Now, Columbus had actually said the earth was smaller than it was and thought he could get there quicker, but nobody believed the earth was flat, but we were taught that, right? Just one of those things that growing up, I remember telling that to my father-in-law, and he's like, no, that's wrong. I'm like, I don't know, the internet says it. It's got to be true, right? I mean, uh, they don't just put fake stuff on the internet, I, if there's anything I know, right? But you know what they did believe in the Middle Ages? They believed that the earth was at the center of the universe, that the heavens revolved around the earth, that the universe revolved around the earth, right? Turns out that's not true, but some people haven't figured out that the universe doesn't revolve around them yet, <laughs> right? Like, some of them still stuck in the Middle Ages still think that, you know, the heavens are just there to, to you know, just be kind of the backdrop. The reason I say that is because it seems it's our nature to pitch a tent when there's something we like and just stay there. It, it's, it's the Mount of Transfiguration all over again, if you know the story, when the, the three disciples went up with Jesus onto this one mountain, all of a sudden Elijah and um, Jesus and, who's the third person? Abraham? Abraham. Moses. Thank you. Gosh. 48, 46. <laughs> yeah. So we were in Romans 8 last week. Romans 8, 18 through 25. If you're like me, you put a ribbon in your Bible there before the service. And I just kind of want to, I knew I was supposed to be in Romans 8 last week because I'm trying to get to this word. For six months now, I've been pulling out words and phrases that we use in Christianity that don't mean things to people outside of here. They don't always understand when we say things like anointing or we say things like, you know, we talk about praying and things like that, what we actually mean when we say it. They have a different idea of what that means. And so last week I got to this place in Romans chapter 8 in, in particular because I do kind of want to read all 10 verses. Um, well, I'll start with a few. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed in us. We have three things working here. We have suffering here, we have glory, and we have revelation. Revealed is revelation for the creature eagerly awakes in anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. And we talked about that late last week about how creation itself is waiting for us to be what we were meant to be, that we were called to be sons and daughters of God, and at some point we are going to walk as judges of the earth, that he has set aside for us this great destiny and purpose that's far beyond. I don't care how far up you get in your company, God has something better for you on the other side of glory than anything you're going to do here. I think sometimes we do get focused on the God help me here and not the God prepare me for there, right? And that's understandable because here is what we know, right? We don't know there. There is a hope, and here is reality, and sometimes I really want to do something now versus later, even though it says that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. If, if you go down here the same way, the first thing it talks about is suffering. From suffering, it goes into, um, in 24, it says, now we hope we were saved. Now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope because who hopes for what he has sees. Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. Paul likes words. Um, I don't know what that's like. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness because we do not know what to pray 
for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes with, uh, for us with unspoken groanings. So there comes this point where our suffering takes us to prayer, and then our prayer itself, sometimes when we're going through stuff, we're praying for God to take the stuff away. And I think part of that is we undervalue suffering. I know, you're like, hey, pastor's preaching on suffering. I'm going down for that altar call. Right? <laughs> Who wants some suffering? Raise your hand, right? We undervalue suffering sometimes, and I say this because I'm, I'm a person who I feel has had my fair share of suffering, and God doesn't want me to suffer anymore from here on out. I'm okay with that, but chances are there's still some stuff he wants me to go through. In fact, I say that even the last year of the church, there's been some tests and trials and things like that that have made me stronger. I was telling Kurt and Wendy before service, it's kind of funny. I, I tore my rotator cuff or something. Um, Kristen, you know, she's, she's always trying to show me up at the food pantry, so I was trying to carry more than she could. Um, and I may have tore something, right? Like, oh, that sounds not right, or that doesn't feel right, or, you know, hey, remember when I could lift my arm all the way up? Those were good days. Um, but what I notice is that the physical therapy place is each time I keep getting a different colored band, right? Once I know how to stretch one band and do all the stuff with one, they give me another band that's actually a little bit stronger, right? It takes a little bit more to pull, and then when you get through that one this week, they gave me this band, and I, he told me he was giving me one for the home and one for the office, and that didn't really register to me. When I got back, they were kind of together, and so I'm grabbing both of them, just, just you know, absolutely killing myself, and I realize, oh, wait, there's two. Um, the point being... At each place where I started to get stronger or a little bit better, they increased the amount of resistance I had to overcome. And in the life of a believer, there will be times when God expects you to overcome some resistance. I know we want that walk with God where it's victory to victory and nothing ever goes. It's all mountaintop to mountaintop. We're just tiptoeing through everything. But the thing about it is, is that there's a whole lot of hurting, suffering people out there that God needs to reach. And the only way he's going to reach is if he's got someone, one of his sons or daughters, that's strong enough to wade out into the battle of somebody's life who, who has rejected everyone else, turned everyone else down, knows all the right arguments to make when you talk about what you want to talk about, and yet can wade through all that and say, I can love you anyway because I've loved some more unlovable people than you before. I can do this, right? We want everybody that loves us to love us back, and they don't. They just don't, right? Sometimes you just throw your heart at somebody, and they're just like, meh, meh, you know, seem better, right? And yet there's something about God that he says, you're going to love the unlovable, you're going to do the unthinkable. He's going to lead us across the path of people who really need him. Because there are plenty of churches out there today that are trying really hard to get people from one church to their church. And that's great, and God bless them. I don't want that. What I want is that 75% of, listen, there are 30,000 people in Belvedere, and if I give them all the credit in the world, still less than 10,000 of them will be in church today, which means 20,000 people within one mile of this building have nowhere to go where they can worship God, to be in a place where God dwells, to be loved by a brother or sister in Christ. 20,000 people, right? And those people aren't going to be reached by people who are just shuffling between churches. They're going to be reached by people who know how to love past what they're in. Amen? So suffering leads to prayer. Sometimes our prayer has to be taken over by the Spirit. There's a praying in the Spirit that has to occur. There's this moment where your spirit is in sync with God's Spirit, and all of a sudden you start praying in a way you haven't prayed before and something changes inside of you, right? And He's, letting, he's leading you. He's, he's leading you to pray for things you don't know to pray for, Right? And then the prayer brings the revelation, right? Setting our problems on the altar makes them smaller and gives them meaning. Did you know that? That suffering without God is meaningless. But no suffering in Christ is meaningless. Because what does the end of this passage say? After all the suffering, after all the prayer, after all the groanings, that all things work together for good for those... Finish it for me. You guys know it, right? that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, that when there is a destiny and a purpose behind what you're going through, it gives even the suffering and even the bad things meaning. But you know what? Without that, it is meaningless because that verse isn't written to everybody. It doesn't say all things work to good for everybody because they just want it really bad. It says all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to their purpose because we're moving towards something. Right? Do you know why I go stretch those stupid bands and they hurt sometimes? And I have this little pulley thing and you got to pull up on the pulley to see how high you can get your arm, which this is, this is way better than it was a couple weeks ago, right? And you got to pull it until it hurts and then hold it. Hang on for a second and then let it go. I don't do that because I just really want to hurt in the morning. Like, you know what? I haven't felt this morning pain. That'd be great. Um, 
I do it because every day I get a little bit stronger. And when you are in Christ, everything you go through every day makes you a little bit stronger. So we get through all that to this. We know that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord, um, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed in the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So we started at suffering and we ended up in glory, right? And that's what I like, that suffering takes us to prayer. Prayer brings revelation, and revelation shows us the glory of God. God's glory should be the ultimate destination of all our prayers. We have heard, do everything for the glory of God. I've heard this word glory just over in the glory land. I've heard glory, 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 somebody touched me. I've heard more songs with the word glory in them than there are sands in the ocean, right? And yet, if you'd have asked me two weeks ago, what does glory mean? Right, if I were to stop and, and wait for definitions of it, and I know this because I listen to a lot of smart people this week, and the funny thing was is how many of them borrow from each other. Like if they use the exact same thought on the exact same verse, you're like, one of you thought that first. Okay, one of you. But I've noticed that a lot of people, and it's almost circular. It's almost, well, glory is, glory is, glory is, glory, and they don't really have an answer for what it actually is. One person says it's a physical manifestation of the invisible attributes of God, which is great, except there are verses where God says he glorifies us, and what does that mean? I guess you could say he makes his invisible attribute. You really got to work to make that definition to work. What I figured out a lot of this is, is language. For instance, if I were to ask you to define the word run, there's more than one definition. My favorite is the word set, S-E-T, has over 400 definitions for it. Did you know that? You can set a bone. You can set something on the table. You can set down for a while. They're all sort of, not set down. That's wrong. That's sit, right? But there are like 400 different definitions. The word runs another one. Your nose can be running. Your car can be running. Your refrigerator can be running. You could be running some errands. You could be running down the street. There's all kinds of things that you use the word run for, and it means different things. And I think when you look through Scripture, you will find that there are, there's glory, and there's glory. In fact, I've kind of separated out between there's small g glory and there's big g glory, right? Like there's glory like that, that we can possess and that we attain and that, and that God gives us and things like that. And then there's glory glory. And I'm not going to get too much into the glory glory this week because I'm not ready. I, I'm reading Mo, uh, Moses asking God to see his glory and how afraid I would be to say that prayer even in here by myself with no one else around because I understand to have the goodness of God pass in front of me would be something I could not take. And if you think you could, that's because you have pride. I'm just telling you. Because there is a goodness and a realness to the glory of God that if he were to show it to you, it would almost just obliterate your... I mean, just, you know, that whole no man can look on the glory of God. There's, this, there's that big G glory. And we're going to talk about Isaiah and Ezekiel next week, but we're going to talk about this other glory, the small G glory this week. Glory cannot be completely defined, but it can be described, right? I can't always... If you were to ask me, give a definition of Kristen... Well, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Give me a definition of Josh, right? If you ask somebody to say, what is it? What are you, right? I mean, it really depends. I'm going to guess, Dan, you're different here than you are at work, right? You've never had to wrestle anybody in our church down, right? You've never had to been like, you know, Joni looks like she's getting a little uppity there. I'm just going to jump over the chair and tackle. You've never had to do that here. At work, you have to do that. So somebody that knows you here, if they were to define you, would give a different definition of you here than they would at work. Now, there are parts of you that are still going to be the same, though, right? There are parts of you that are at the core of you, and the people that know you best know those parts never disappear. Some people are such chameleons that they completely disappear depending on where they're at next. They go from one place to another place, and everything they were here, they change for here, and then they change again for here. And we know we go to church with Christians, right? We'll do the Christians, right? We don't, you know, with people who are only this way when they're here. Amen? You can say it. You know one of them. You might be one. I don't know. I'm not judging. I am judging, I guess, right? I mean, you're saying it. You're judging. But let's start with this. Psalms 8, 3 through 6, and I gave you guys all the scriptures because I've got like a the, this is the thing, Sharon. So I'm, I'm going through every verse with glory in it because I like to go through, but I can't just read a verse, right? I have to read a verse and I have to like dissect it and look at what commentators say and look at what other people say and I just read it again and then I, you know, study it. And, I, and so there are 
hundreds of verses in the Bible that have glory in it. But this one I like to start with because this was my, fa my dad's favorite verse, and that is this. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. One of the first things you hear about glory, especially if you're like me and you like to study medieval authors, and hey, who doesn't, right, is they were really against any personal glory, right? Anything that said, hey, if you draw any attention to yourself or say anything good about yourself, that's bad. Can I tell you that humility is not the same as self-loathing? Can I tell you that? Not liking yourself is not the same as actually being humble. Because let me tell you something I know from having dedicated a baby or two. Every little baby that I dedicate, you can almost see that little crown of glory God has set on their head. You know that? That when he made that little creature, right, that little person came into the world. And I know think we, we think we did it, right? You know, we, um, two on purpose, right? Um, I kid. <laughs> little joke there, little joke. Um, but God is the one that gives them that life, and when that life comes out, you can almost see, like they're in the hospital, when it first cries, when it first moves, right? Like God meant for those fingers to move. God meant for those toes to move, for that voice to make sound, that he made this little creature just a little bit lower than the heavenly beings. We're not up there. We don't have all the knowledge and all the strength maybe. that. I, but you know what? He made us like we are. He just puts a little crown of glory on us. Let me tell you something about humility. There is absolutely nothing wrong with a son or daughter of God wanting their father to look at them and be proud. In fact, I would hope most of you want God to look down on you and be happy with what you've done today. I lay down every night, and those are the conversations I'm having with him as I'm going to bed, you know, is kind of what's happened during the day. And I want him to be happy with how I did my job, how I run the church, how I do the administrative things, as well as the ministry things. I want God to be happy with that. And that's not being vain, and that's not being prideful. That's just, I want my dad to like this. Look what I made you, Dad. Look what I made today. I made accounting decisions right? Here's your accounting decisions. Every one of you, when you go to your job, you're actually supposed to do it as unto the Lord, right? Which means at the end of the day, whatever you do in whatever job you have, whether you're at home or a corporation, at the end of the day, you can hand that to God and say, this is what I did today, God. These are the things I did. Now, I made some decisions that don't have big eternal, you know, repercussions, but you know what? There was also this one person who was hurting, and I put my arm around him, and there was also this one person that had a question about you, and I was the one that answered it, and there was also this one time when I built relationship with somebody who does, doesn't even have any other Christians in their life, and you can offer those to him before too, right? And there's a thing about, at the end of the day, being able to offer what you did to God, because you should want what you do to be pleasing to God, Right? And I know, Robin, we're all worms, filthy worms under the foot of, you know, I, I, I get that, right? That's very Calvinist. Um, but we go within the AG because we don't have a lot of theology. So Isaiah 6.3 says this. And one called another. It's funny, he had actually changed it. My eyes didn't quite catch the change. My brain didn't switch over. And then one called to another and said, holy, 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 the is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is filled with of his glory. Now, when we're saying glory here, we don't mean the whole earth is full of the glory of God to the point that every time you walk outside, your eyes are burned out by the glory of God just radiating off the grass and the trees and everything out there, right? And yet the whole earth is full of his glory. Glory, what you create shows your glory. I, I have this great thing. I, I got into some of the, I didn't get way into the advanced math. But I got far enough into math to know this. There's a thing called the golden ratio. I don't know if you know this, but a conch shell and a snail shell and leaves and everything all have a specific ratio that they build themselves by when they grow. And it's called the golden ratio. Look it up sometime. It's like a number. It's like one point something, 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 whatever. But it's the reason why it grows into a perfect cone. It's the reason why an oak leaf grows into the shape. Not just that the oak leaf grows into the shape, but the same shape, that same formula that grows the oak leaf into the shape that it makes also makes the trees all about the same shape. When they're left with nothing else interfering from the outside, they all grow into this little bulb shape, don't they? Why is that? Because there's a specific ratio built into all of creation that mathematically they're always going to end up the same way. It's almost like God just put his little fingerprint right on that thing. 
right? I, I say it's like the number pi, and I, I'm getting really nerdy today. We're getting, we're getting super nerdy. If you take the number pi as 3.14, and then it goes off into infinity with its digits, it's what's called an unreal number, meaning the number has no end. But that means if you took the number pi and you calculated it out far enough, you would find your birthday in there. If you calculate it out far enough, you would find your social security number in there. If you calculate it out far enough, you will find all information that has ever existed inside of that, right? And it's just one little number. And do you know why that number is that number? Because that number shows up everywhere in nature. That whenever we make a circle, that number pi comes into play. Anytime you take a certain amount of curves and you make them 360 degrees, that math always works out the same way because there is on God the fingerprint of everything he's ever made, right? It's the same way with you. Did you know that? That everything you do, you're leaving your fingerprint on. You're making it. You're doing it. And there's a little bit of your glory you're putting into it. Right? John makes pictures at the crafting thing on Fridays. Is John here? Uh, uh, yeah, right, John? John makes these pictures at the crafting things on Fridays. And I always see them when I come in on Sunday morning. That's one of the first things I see is what picture John has made that week, Right? That there's that sense of he has put this together and he is proud of it and God has given him the ability. And, and here is this picture. Here is this little microcosm of beauty in the entire universe, right? It may never be on the news. It may never travel around the world. But here, one of God's children has made something beautiful and put their hand on it. And there's a little bit of the glory of the creator in that. The creator that created the creator that created, right? That God created you to make things, right? To build things, to make the world more beautiful. Do you think God put us here to make everything uglier and more terrible? Or did he put us here as champions of grace, as trophies of grace, right? And everything we build, we put a little bit of our own small g glory in. Did you know that? That includes your kids. Did you know that? I, I'll, I, I, might, I might be getting ahead of myself there. Let me, get, let me go down. Matthew 5.16 says... In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So what he's saying is you should do things that let your light shine and give glory to God. Now, who's giving the glory there? Well, other people in this case. We also give glory. Did you know glory is transferable? Right? That if you look over in Scripture over and over and over again, and I'll talk about this in a couple places, and I do not have time to go into all the verses because this is all through Scripture, but glory is literally transferable. God glorifies us sometimes. Sometimes we give glory to God. Several times in the Psalms it says, give glory to God. How do you, if, okay, so everybody's heard that phrase, give glory to God, right? But if I'm like, hey, give glory to God right now, I bet in here we'd have a hundred different ways of giving glory to God. Right? Because we don't have a solid, well, give glory to God means I, mean to, I need to sing how great thou art. I don't know. It means I need to pray in a certain way. I don't know. It means I just need to shout or yell or dance or whatever, right? Give glory to God changes with each person. But the thing about it is, is glory is transferable. You can take the glory that people give you and give that back to God, right? You can take things and they say, hey, you're doing a good job at that. And you can say, you know why I'm doing a good job of that? Because God has given me the ability to do this job. Of that. He has given me the skills and the talent. He has raised me as one of his own, and now I can do that. And so you've taken the glory that they've given you, and you've given that to God. Glory is transferable. Now, it's going to get crazy when we get to next week and we start talking about Isaiah and Ezekiel because they knew about glory in a way I don't even know. Right? I just read what they wrote and try to make the most out of it because they had some stuff going on. Let me tell you, but I like this. It says in the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works. So you're doing the good works, right? And give glory to your Father is in heaven. Can I ask you this question? If you call yourself a Christian, does calling yourself that make God look better or worse? Right? If I say you're a Christian and someone says they're a Christian, is their immediate thought of God better or worse? Because, see, that's the thing, right? We're his kids. We're his creation. Not only we're his creation, we're the ones that claim the name of his son and call ourselves by that name Christian. So the question is, when someone says you're a Christian, does that make God look better or worse? <laughs> that's a scary question, isn't it? You know, you do more to praise God at Walmart than you do in praise and worship service here because nobody in here is doubting whether or not you're a Christian or wondering whether or not you've got anything different than them. We're all here because we're broken and seeking God and we're all blessing the Lord. But there's a time at Walmart where somebody who knows you're a Christian and you don't know they're watching you and you do something and they see that and now you've either brought glory or shame to the name of God and you have more of an impact there than you do here a lot of times. 
You can do more to give glory to God in a place where we're not all gathered to do the same thing than you can here. Because here, this is really for us a lot of times. I mean, it is for people who come in and are wandering and aren't saved, and we try to reach them, and we try to love them, and that's why we do the food pantry, so we can bring more of them in and reach them and love them. But a lot of what we do here, because it's a tough world out there, Mona. It's, it's rough, right? It takes it out of us. You know, by the time I get from Monday to Friday, and I've been bivocational most of my life, so I know what it's like to come to a Wednesday night service after coming home from work, right? In fact, I'd have to preach them sometimes. I would drive out to the church, go inside the church, fall asleep on the pew by the door. When I heard the door open, I'd pop up and greet. Hey, how's it going, right? I know how the world can take it out of you, and a lot of what we do here is for that. But can I tell you something, that you give more glory to God when out in the world you show His goodness. I always hate the illustration that I saw once that <laughs> I was at a donut store because I could do that back then. It was such a happy time in my life. Um, I, I have not had a donut since February, right? We're, gonna, we're coming up on one year of no donuts. Um, but I remember I was there. There was a woman behind the counter. She was Indian. She had the dot. She had everything. There was a person in front of me who was very well dressed. He was obviously going to early service. I was going to late service because I'm still in shorts and a t-shirt. He got a really nice car out there, and his wife is in the car, and she's just dressed to the T's, and he's dressed to the T's, and the woman behind is struggling to get something done, and the man is sitting there going, <sighs> <sighs> you know, tapping his foot. Oh, my God. Are you going to hurt? I mean, really just giving her the business over her not getting his thing done. And I'm thinking, she knows you're a Christian. She sees it Sunday morning. You're dressed up and getting in a nice car with a nicely dressed person. There's absolutely no thought in her mind that you're not a Christian. That's who she thinks you is. And you're treating her like garbage. You're going to go and praise God and sing, how great is, your, how great is our God? He might be, but you're not showing it. Amen? All right. We'll get nice here in a second, I promise. I say that a lot. In the New Testament, there's a New Testament word for glory. There's an Old Testament word for glory. In the New Testament, it's doxa, and it means reputation, right? So when we're bringing glory to God, we're actually increasing the reputation of God, right? When we do things that bring glory to God, we are increasing the reputation of God. Right? I always say that I want our church to be so awesome that other communities are like, man, I wish I had a B1 in my neighborhood. I wish there was a church like that near me. I wish those kind of people would be where we're at because a lot of times the image of the church is not like that. Right? And so the question is not only do your actions make being a Christian better or worse, but now we'll get more personal, is who you are making our church look better or worse. Right? And I'll put myself in there. There are times, you guys know, I can get grumpy, I can get snippy, I can get hungry. You know, when I get hungry, that's the worst because I don't want to talk to nobody or do nothing, right? And I still have to snap. And it was so funny because I was, <laughs> we were at KFC last night um, because it was late at night and we wanted KFC, right? She had, you know, Kristen's been doing this calorie thing, so she's been saving all her calories for this moment. So do you know that if you have not eaten much all day and you're saving all your calories for one grand, you know, thousand calorie meal at the end of the day, basically, right, that she checked the bag, <laughs> right? So when they brought the bag out, because it took them a few minutes because we did the Long John Silvers and the KFC, we're getting the full buffet going, right? And she's like, no, check the bag, right? So checks the bag. There's no wedges, yeah, we're not going to let that go if we've been waiting all day for this. So, of course, I have to be the one that goes back in, and I tell the lady, hey, uh, we paid for wedges. There's no wedges. She's like, did you check in the box? I said, yeah, I checked in the box. And she started to argue with me a little bit, and I, and I, was, and I almost argued back, but I stopped, and I was, like, I was like, I can go check again if you want. And I realized in that moment she remembered who I was. I don't know how she knows me, but I know she did because she looked at me, she blinked, and her personality changed. Right? Like, like, I wasn't going to argue. I wasn't going to be mean because that's, that's not who I want to be to somebody who doesn't. You know, I always say, don't be mean to cat to the people at the register. They can't defend themselves. They have to be nice even when you're a, a monster, right? They still have to be, thank you and my pleasure, right? You know, so always be nice to them. And, and so I was trying to, but I realized that there was that part of me that did want to argue and there was that part. Of course I checked for the wedges. My wife, and, and if I'm being completely honest, when my wife noticed there weren't any, I was not super enthused about going back in. How many husbands know what I mean when the wife's like, they don't have something in here, you got to go, I want to go back in. I don't want to talk to them again, 
right? So I was already not at my spiritual highest going back in, but I knew I did it. I sucked it up. I got in there. I did it, and I realized that when she realized who I was, not only did her personality change, she said, I'll get you those, and she goes back and gets it, and then she takes two cookies and puts them in the bag, too, and I wanted to say, what are you doing to me, lady? Um, <laughs> But she all of a sudden became really nice and really helpful and all that. And I realized it was because she knew who I was. She's been either to the pantry or she's been here to church or she's seen me on Facebook or something, right? So the question is, how do your actions out in the real world make the church look, right? Because part of our mission, <laughs> I don't want our church to grow for growth's sake. I don't want us to be bigger for bigness' sake. I want our church to grow because there's 20,000 people that have no idea that we're here doing the will of God, loving on people, and trying to see his kingdom come. Right? That there are people who are going to go to bed tonight thinking nobody loves them, nobody cares about them. Do you know that suicide is overtaking automobile accidents and the number of deaths per year? Did you know that? Suicide is just on a rocket. And it's because there's no hope. And because when there isn't any hope, there's no one to say, hey, I can give you hope. Because the church is still worried that they're going to think we're Christians. Right? Just like a Wednesday night, I've got about seven more of these, and it's 10 till, and I told them to bring the kids back in at, at noon. Um, we're going to bring the kids in. We're going to do communion at the end, but I want to do it as a family just to kind of prepare you for that. So when you see the kids come marching in, that's on purpose, unlike some of the other things I've done this morning. Psalms 29 Verses 1 through 3 says this. We're going to talk about glory moves upward. So Psalms 29 says, Psalm of David, ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Give him glory. So we can, our glory can flow upward to God. Our glory. And it's a weird thing to think about because whenever we use the word glory, we're always talking about the glory of God. But what I'm telling you is you have some glory. Somebody likes you, right? Somebody actually thinks highly of you. Somebody actually would be surprised if you were to do something mean and out of character. Did you know that? And that is part of your glory. It's part of your reputation. It's part of what people think about you. And that can flow upward. It says, ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Next verse says, ascribe to the Lord glory, do his name, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The voice of the Lord thunders the Lord over many waters. Oh, I love that, right? I, just, I love the imagery of some of these psalms. Like when we sang Psalm 46, you're with us in the fire, with us in the battle. Oh, I love that, right? And we're ascribing glory to the Lord for all of the things he does. Nature itself has his imprint. We should be thankful for that. We should be thankful for the people around us that have God's glory. You know what? That's why we, I don't know if you know this, but most of the people here, there's a few of you that don't like us, but most of the people here like each other, and we like being here. And there's something about when other people come here, they just end up staying for a while because there's this sort of glory going around where we're all glorifying each other and we're all glorifying the Lord. It's okay to glorify someone else. Did you know that? I can say something nice about somebody else, and, and I don't know why the thing, well, but their head will get big. If I tell them they do that well, they'll just think, you know, that's just them, and that's not the Lord, and I've got to keep them humble. It is not your job to keep anyone humble, okay? Who opposes, who opposes the proud? The Lord opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. So if somebody has a real problem with pride, whose job is it to knock them down a peg? The Lord's, right? According to Scripture, I don't know why it is. Sometimes we think, you know, that person's pretty uppity with themselves. I'm going to take them out at the knees and just show them the love of Jesus. Amen? Right? I'm just going to let them know how much they need to be in their place. God bless them. Right? The Lord opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. We, more, we need to worry more about encouraging and edifying and building up one another. Amen? Next, glory moves downward. John 17.1 says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, this hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Anything Jesus does, he does as an example for us. He is God made flesh, and yet in the garden, before he begins the most passionate prayer of his ministry, the only real full prayer, like, like the Lord's prayer is his public prayer, right? That's his, I'm in front of people and I'm teaching you a prayer prayer. John 17 is his, I'm about to go to the cross and it's breaking my heart. And even as I'm crying here, my disciples are going to fall asleep they're going to leave. They're going to flee me. And all of these things are going to happen. And what is the first thing he says? Father, glorify your son that the son may glorify you. 
glory flows downward and glory flows upward. God wants to glorify you past, present, and future tense. He wants to make your past not so bad. He wants to make your future, your present better, and he wants to make your future awesome. Next, I'm going to try and get through a couple of these faster. Glory can be given, and here's an interesting one. Glory can be taken away. Job 19.9, when Job is talking about the things he's going through, he says, he has stripped from me my glory and taken the crown from my head. And he's saying that God has stripped my reputation. Most often, I don't think we need for God to do that. I think we do a lot of that on our own. Amen. Our actions can bring disgrace. On, I, I don't want to get too much into that. It's kind of depressing, right? But we've seen it. If you live long enough, your heroes will fall, right? If you live long enough, the people you look up to, they're going to do something. If you, stay, if you watch me long enough, I'm going to trip and fall, and you're going to be like, I didn't, can't believe Pastor tripped and fall. Turns out I'm a person, right? And if you live long enough, that's why old people, we don't have heroes. I remember my dad telling me that. We went to see a Henson's concert. Anybody remember the Henson's? Um, they were friends of my dad. My dad had this conversation. I don't know what you remember the weirdest things with your parents, right? And I remember this conversation with my dad. He said, I know for you it's a big deal to meet your rock stars, but for me, these are just my friends. Because like, I go see Petra and those guys, you know, and if I got to meet them, I'm like, oh, you know, I get to meet Petra, right? Remember, I, I missed my chance to meet Carmen. I was so heartbroken. Um, I was a I was a usher and helper at a Carmen concert, and there was a meeting where everybody's going to get together, and Carmen was going to talk to them individually. And you're, you're going to be shocked. I was off goofing off talking to somebody and missed my chance, and they held the little huddle, and I came back, and I was like, what? I didn't get to talk to Carmen, right? But my dad always said, you know, for you to talk to them, they're your heroes. For me, they're just my friends because these were people he grew up with. And my dad had lived long enough, right, that he understands that heroes all let you down eventually. So glory can be stripped away. Next, in 1 Kings 8.11, glory can be manifest and tangible. And this is where we start to get into the big G glory, right? Um, this is about when the first temple was dedicated. It said that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. This is what people think about when we talk about glory is that tangible, physical times in the Old Testament where the glory comes down like that. And I would even say that in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, when it's talking about tongues of fire, right, that I'll bet you that atmosphere was so full of glory, right? So that it came down and it filled the house. Glory can be tangible. In the Old Testament, glory means weight, right? It means kabod. It means something that has weight. They say that something that has weight is more important than something that doesn't have weight. If you're holding two things, if I were to pick up a plate and one plate was really light and felt plasticky and one plate you pick up and it feels really heavy, you think, well, this must be the more expensive plate. There was that same sense. That's one of the reasons why gold became so valuable. One, because of its rarity. Two, because it was one of the heaviest metals they had right? So anything with gold on it would have more weight. Not only that, are you ready for this? For you to have glory, your words would have more weight. They would have more impact. You know, some people don't understand why nobody listens to them, and the reason they don't listen to them is because their words have no impact because they use whatever words are available instead of using words that are precious. Are you ready for that? They'll pick up whatever light words will get them through the situation. They'll say whatever they have to say because that's what they want to say because it's the easiest thing to say so that when you go to say something that is real, all of a sudden people won't listen because your words don't have any weight. They don't have any glory. Go ahead. Come on in, kids. You can come on in. We know, hey, stomp, be loud. I told somebody, I don't think God has any problems with kids in his living room. Amen. Anybody a grandparent who's like, man, I wish these kids would stop coming over to the house making a mess. You're like, make a mess, kids, as long as you hang out with mom and dad, right? As long as you hang out with grandma and grandpa. I'll just kind of say these last two. Um, God, glory is revealed in our victory. Um, Proverbs 25.2, just real quick, because this verse is going to come back up. I don't know why God is speaking this particular verse to a lot of people all over the world right now. I have noticed this from time to time as a preacher that God moves in such a way that multiple people hear the same message. And he has been saying to a lot, it is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings to search things out. It's our glory to search out the hidden glory that God has put around us and in creation. And then lastly, God's glory is also revealed in our defeats. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it's talking about Paul's thorn in the flesh, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power, my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Even in moments where we don't get over things, glory is still revealed. T.D. Jake said, 
that in between every stage of glory is a stage of affliction. You go from glory to affliction to glory. The trick is to not stop at affliction, right? A lot of us stop when we get to the hard part, and we never get to that last part, which is in 2 Corinthians. Turn there with me if you would. If you have your Bibles, we're going to finish with this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. If you're like me, you put one of your ribbons in there. If you're like me, you have multiple ribbons in your Bible, and you can actually mark multiple places. I think it was, uh, Nathan was like really impressed that I had like multiple ribbons in my Bible. Actually, I was too when I got it. See, I make fun of you. I was super impressed with that. I was like, oh, it's got multiples. I can do that. In chapter 3, and I don't have time to do the whole chapter. I, I really want to because I love the chapter so much. There's so much good in it. Let's just go down to 17 because we're at 12 o'clock. And it says this, Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen? We ever sang that song? Woo! We, now listen to this, we all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord. When he's talking about unveiled faces, he's talking about when Moses came down from the mountain after getting the Ten Commandments, his face was shining with glory to the point they had to cover his face because they couldn't look at him because he was shining with the glory of God as he came down from the mountain. And now what he is saying is because we have Christ, we look at the glory of God with unveiled faces. We don't have to shy away or be hidden from the glory of God. It says, with, we all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of God, and we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Remember the picture last week I had of the family with all the mullets? The whole family had mullets. The more you look at Christ, the more you follow Christ, the more you're going to change into the appearance, right? The more your life is going to change and mold and become like that so that you'll have the same mullet Christ would have had if Christ had mullets. It's the only fashion accessory I can think of. Um, you know what? In the 90s, we thought it was cool. Billy Ray Cyrus had one. We were okay with it. I wanted one at one point, but I was in the military, and we couldn't grow one. I even thought about sneaking a rat tail in there. Remember rat tails? Oh, Lord Jesus. So it says this, we are all, everybody's like, rat tails, whoa, one. We all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being, so we're looking at the goodness of him, the things that he has done. We are wanting to be like that. We want to be about our father's business. We want to do what God has done so that we become more like him in his son. Amen? What God did in your life is not as important as what he is going to do. What God has done in your life is not as important as what he is going to do. What happens is when we get older, I'm 46, right? So I'm, I'm right there with everybody. I'm probably the oldest person in the room. Um, I'm kidding, right? But the older I get, the less new music I like. Amen? Anyone, right? I, I think there's actually a scientific thing that they say the older you get, the less, you know. The first time I heard, you know, the music of my teenage years on classic rock, was a, it was a moment, right? Like, what is that doing on that station? You know, that shouldn't be there, right? Sometimes we get very focused in on what God has done for us. But let me tell you something. I don't care how old you are. God has a destiny in front of you that is greater than what is behind you. And if you keep looking back to where you were, uh, listen, okay, I'm going to say the meanest thing I probably ever said. You ready for it? I was raised on old-time religion. I was raised on old-time Pentecostal services. There was something about that that got into my spirit, that got into my soul. But can I tell you something? <sighs> we messed up. You know how I know we messed up? Because look at the world I'm living in now. If all of those services and all those late nights and all the things we were doing, and let me tell you something, and I'm going to be really mean to some of us that are older, there was a lot of it where we weren't even doing the thing to have the new thing. We were just trying to get what our parents had or their parents had. And we're living in a generation of people that have raised up as Pentecostals who have absolutely no idea what it means to feel the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit because for us, feeling the baptism of the Holy Spirit was just so we could have the experience that other people had and had nothing to do with having the power to evangelize the world. And if you're my age or older, we messed up. Because look at the world we're in. Our church should be changing the world. 
There is a power of God and the glory of God that if it was reflected in his kids, this world would not be what it is. And if it's not, I'm the first one to take responsibility and say, there were times in my life where I could have stood up for Christ and I didn't. There were times when I could have proclaimed his name and I didn't. There were places where I could have said, I'm a Christian and I believe in him and I can't stand by while you mock him, but I didn't because there was a time where I was too afraid. And look at the world that we've inherited now. What I'm saying is there is a glory for the church greater than what we have left behind. And if we keep looking behind to what God used to do, we will never get to what God wants to do. Amen? That is the meanest thing I'll ever say. Probably not. You know me. Our hope lies in the future promises of God. And with that, ushers, if you would come forward.